Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, the number one podcast for drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, tradition, and more. Hi. Welcome to the 107th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first time guest of the show, Jeff Morgan. Well, thank you, Rabbi. It's great to be on the show. And uh, I'm on the show only because I've seen your show. And I thought, gee, why can't I be on this show? I want to be on the show. I want to be on Rabbi Drew's show. And thank you for uh, including me in the uh, program. Absolutely my pleasure. So for those less familiar with Jeff, aside from uh, apparently watching the show, which is really wonderful, he is a, I'm a, can I, you're a highly decorated kosher bent. Is that a fair, simple way of putting you? I think I've just done a lot, uh, Drew. I've done, okay. you know, I've been in the wine business 30 years, 30, actually 32 years. You know, I've probably done, something that no other winemaker or wine writer or wine salesperson or wine anybody has done. I have yeah. done everything. You know, I've written about wine as a wine writer for the Wine Spectator, the New York mm-hmm. Times, Wine Enthusiast, Food and Wine Magazine. I've made Covenant for the last 18 years. I, I've done the math. It looks like we've made over a million bottles in the last 18 years and uh, and sold them all. So right. that's a lot of wine to sell and make. Covenant and Covenant is the only winery, um, which I founded with my wife, um, Jody, and, and my late partner, Leslie Rudd, mm-hmm. is the only winery in the world that actually makes wine in both California and Israel. So we're actually a double winery, uh, and I'll be in Israel in about a week, taking care of business over there. So, um, oh yeah, I forgot. We, we also write cookbooks about food and wine. So Jody and I have written 10 cookbooks, starting with Dean and DeLuca 20 years ago, and finishing in about five years ago with the Covenant Kitchen, Food and Wine for the New Jewish Table, which is a kosher cookbook written in conjunction with the OU. So I got vetted, uh, had a wow. few arguments about really big arguments about like, you know, Choland, like what makes it kosher? We, they didn't like my recipe, okay? Because <laughs> I didn't sit on one foot and hold on to somebody while we uh, opened the oven to check on things. So it was, um, but we, we finally came to a compromise and, our cowboy Choland, cowboy Choland, why cowboy Choland? Because we're in California, we got cowboys, Jewish cowboys. So the cowboy <laughs> Choland in the Covenant Kitchen um, has two versions, <laughs> the OU version and my version. So in the 90s, you were a writer. Yeah, the 90s, you were a writer. 2003, you founded, co-founded Covenant and a yeah. whole bunch so of stuff. We wrote, I wrote the 10 cookbooks to, to finance uh, Covenant because we didn't get paid for a long time. Ah. If you want to get rich in the wine business fast, don't start a winery. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually really helpful advice. This is very helpful yeah. advice. All yeah. right. So we're doing a lot of talking about wine. So uh, this is, uh, you know what? We're going to, I'm going to drink along. I hope, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. It sounds appropriate. Right. And as I said, I've, I've gone straight to my, our, our, our brandy, our newest brand, batch of 5779 brandy, double edged sword. I definitely want to talk about that. I hope to be getting to that uh, soon enough. So we'll get to so, that. But anyway, so I'm drinking with you. L'chaim. All right. L'chaim. Wow. It's fairly soft, pretty drinkable. It's not hard. It doesn't have harsh. It's really cool. You're drinking the 2020 Covenant Lavan? Yes. Yes. Chardonnay. It's a nice bottle. <laughs> it is a nice bottle. It's definitely it's very Covenant. decorative. As opposed to the, the uh, bottles for the other, for the reds, it's, the white is definitely very colorful. Well, well, so that's the Covenant, the original Covenant label. And did you notice anything on the label that made you think of Jews and wine? I don't recall the label that well. Sorry. So here's, so here's it, next, the next show you'll have the label. So I'm just going to explain to the readers, everything has meaning to me, yeah. particularly wine, which I think gives meaning to life, at least my life. And oh, it, um, yeah. yeah, there it is. Anyway, I'm to look at my the picture Covenant of the bottle. Label, yeah, a lot of people think the Covenant label is just a pretty, um, you know, Chagall-like image. And in fact, it is inspired by a Chagall stained glass window. In that painting, it's an original painting uh, from an artist in the Napa Valley. And in it, um, we have, we, we have, we were talking about what does the name covenant mean to um, a Jew? Um, It means more than a Brit Milah. It means a strong connection between God and Mm -hmm. his people Strong connection, perhaps, between people and people. 
Mm -hmm. Jews and Jews. Um, any strong connection is a covenant. So we kind of wanted to pick various, you know, a covenant to focus on. And we decided to pick the covenant of the commandments. And so if you look on the label, you'll see the, t the tablets uh, yeah. in the background. Ah, okay. And, I thought it was uh, a big heart. Well, you know, if you're not Jewish, you think it's a heart. If you're a, <laughs> a, if you're a Jew who's wondering, what is that? <laughs> you might say, oh, those are, those are like the commandments, those are like the tablets. So, so when Moses went up. Rounded know, top, rounded top tablets. Rounded top tablets. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. That's another it's, debate. Uh, you know, it's artistic. Artistic license. When Moses came down from the mountain with that covenant, the commandments, what did they do? As he's coming down the mountain, I'm talking oh, about the second time. Oh, the second time. Uh, so uh, the first time, we, no, we don't dwell on the first time. The second time, he comes down and they blow the <laughs> he shofar. He them the first time. Yeah. So uh, probably they blew the shofar the first time, too. I don't know. But the second time, they blow the shofar. So there they are. On the, There's a guy blowing the shofar on that label. For, for some strange reason, it looks a little like me. But, you know, I don't know if you know this. I'm a saxophone player also. So maybe she was inspired by, by my saxophone playing. But anyway, okay, Moses comes down. They blow the shofar. And he shares the covenant with all the Jewish people, 12 tribes. Hmm. And each one is symbolized by a candle. And if you count the candles on the label, there are 12 candles, one for each of the tribes. Oh, wow. And then what did they do? They drank the wine in the Kiddush cup or something. <laughs> and the big Kiddush cup, bronze uh, foil on the label also. So there are all these symbols in the in the um, in the on the label that kind of um, I hope connect us and anybody who's looking at the label to our heritage and our mm. history. That's really wonderful. So it it interweaves the tradition wine together. So it's not just some wine company. You're saying there's there's an intrinsic quality of the Jewish aspect. Yeah. But um, and it's very colorful. It reminds me of a rainbow. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Yeah. When we did this label, um, it was it was the beginning of covenant. Uh, at the time, um, you know, we'll tell this story maybe in a moment. But I, I didn't make covenant because I was such an observant Jew and I wanted to sanctify the Sabbath with wine that I could make by myself. Okay. Uh, I actually made, I started covenant because I was a non-kosher winemaker in Napa Valley. Um, and we tasted a really good Israeli wine that wasn't kosher. We thought it was kosher, and we all said, wow, this is really good. And then somebody <laughs> said, I bet, I bet you can't make a kosher wine that good. And I said, I can. And it, ah. that's how it all So it really is a very oddball story. Um, so uh, long story short, I, I'm sitting around. I got like 25 barrels of this stuff, Napa Valley Cabernet, ready to bottle. I don't know what to call it. I don't have the labels yet. I don't have a name for the wine. This was about a year and a half after we made it, the first vintage in 2003. Huh. And um, a friend of mine who uh, had a more religious upbringing than I did in New York, he was hanging out at my house and he goes, oh, I should call it Covenant. And <laughs> I said, that, that sounds, sounds kind of Jewish, religious, not too much, but you know, enough. <laughs> Let's use that. All right. <laughs> so that became the name. And, and then we we pursued, you know, the, we studied a little bit more of the meaning of the word covenant and bait in in, in, mm -hmm. in Hebrew, and which I didn't read at the time, um, and I'd never been bar mitzvah at the time, and basically I was a newbie. Uh, I wasn't even bal tshuva; I was nothing. I, mean, I was Jewish, but I was, you know, grew up in New York. Uh, my wife and I grew up in New York. We're the only two Jews on the Upper West Side that um, never went to synagogue and um, <laughs> confused, you know, Pesach with um, um, Hanukkah. <laughs> so, so it was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty barren uh, Jewish background for us. Yeah. But anyway, so, so then um, ultimately, um, years later, uh, when I became a little more, a lot more observant, actually, um, I found out, it is the part where I get emotional. Oh, okay. <laughs> I okay. found out more about the covenant. And I, I joined a synagogue. I have to have a drink here. Quick drink. That's what it's for. I joined an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, we left Napa Valley. There weren't enough Jews for me. Not, and then there was no, no, no Orthodox synagogue. And by that time, I'd been making covenant for about 12 years. And you're still in Northern California? Yeah, I'm in Berkeley, uh, a block and a half from the only Orthodox synagogue in Berkeley, modern Orthodox synagogue. Yeah. So, Is, that Rabbi Cohen? Is that Rabbi Cohen? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's Jonathan Cohen's show. 
And um, anyway, so. Um, by the way, I do I, have to yeah. insert. I do have to insert. He went to the same rabbinical school as me. So. Oh, that's how, you're one of those guys. Yes, I'm one of them. That's, good. that's why I knew Rabbi Mazalto. Cohen. Yes. Yeah, Mazalto. I was going to ask. I didn't want to pry, but yeah. So Rabbi Cohen, by the way, is a friend, a mentor, and an amazing mensch. Uh, all cool. of the above. He's extraordinary. An extraordinary uh, person. That's wonderful. Uh, and uh, very happy to be a part of his flock. But That's great um, so we join the synagogue. We join the synagogue, and somebody says, uh, oh, "Yeah, the covenant, the covenant. Yeah, we love the wine." And, <laughs> and they say, "So, so, so." Um, I, you know, I never belonged to a synagogue when I joined. I was sixty when I joined, and never any synagogue. So they said, "So, what was your parsha?" And I said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, I don't know. You know, I I didn't have a bar mitzvah." And they said, "Really?" And I, I said, "So somebody said, let's figure it out." So they did the math. It turns out my Parsha, the one I should have had when I was 13, mm -hmm. and the one I ultimately read when I was 63, is Noah. Mm. Ah, the first vintner. The first winemaker, yeah. but also, as far as I know, it's the first covenant in the Bible. Ah. The covenant is the rainbow covenant. Mm. So it's like, wow, that's that's deep. Yeah. So anyway, so we, we didn't know it at the time, but we were like totally connecting, totally connected. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really great. Well, so anyway, before, so but, I but between, no, well, well, between your sort of wager that you couldn't make a good kosher wine and the bar mitzvah, the reading of Parshas Noah, how much did your personal Jewish journey and your winemaking journey intertwined? Well, very briefly, it's, if I, in a nutshell, could, could summarize my wine Jewish journey, yeah. I would say yeah. that wine most definitely brought me and my family back to Judaism. There's no question about it. That's what I want to, uh, that's I amazing. Mean, <laughs> I mean, it started, you're not going to believe this, very briefly, I, I was, um, Living in, I'm a New Yorker. My wife's a New Yorker. We were living in uh, Long Island in the wine country where I, I was in the wine business. I was a wine. I worked in a winery, not a kosher winery. I was a cellar guy. And uh, then I started writing freelance for a couple of local papers. One of them was the New York Times. And um, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, I had this big story on Long Island wines come out. And it was yeah. um, it was read by the editor of the Wine Spectator magazine who had given the winery I had previously worked for some pretty high scores. We were the first Long Island winery to break 90. Uh, this was back in 1990 or 1991. Hmm. Anyway, in 1991, I get this article. I finally get in the Times, and um, Tom Matthews calls me, and he goes, hey, Jeff, like, we know you make wine, or we didn't know you were a wine writer. Hmm. And I said, well, you know, I wasn't a wine writer when I was making wine at Christina Vineyards when you gave us that 90 points for the Chardonnay, but now I, you know, now I'm writing about wine. I guess if you can talk, you can write. I don't know. Nobody told me otherwise. So, um, <laughs> so he said, well, I have a story. For you. And I said, you're kidding. The wine spectator has a story for me. And um, I, he said, yeah. I said, I can't believe this. this is my dream come true. I mean, I've been reading the wine spectator for years, you know, and he said, well, okay. So I said, what's the story? He said, we want you to write about kosher wine for Passover. Huh. And I said, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing about I said, it. I said, I said, I know nothing about kosher wine. I know nothing about kosher anything. I don't know anything about Judaism. I know nothing. And he said, looks at me. In the old days, you could say things like, but you're Jewish, right? And I said, yeah, I'm Jewish. Said, of course I'm Jewish. You know, I'm <laughs> Jewish. So he says, look, that's fine. Oh, last year we had a non-Jew write the story and we were accused of anti-Semitism. So because the wines were really terrible and that's what we wrote. And so he said, this year you can write what you want. You can write the wines are terrible. Well, at least we have a Jew and we're safe. Okay. It works. I said, uh, uh, and he said, uh, and he said, look, this is it. This is your foot in the door, Morgan. Take it or leave it. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, in a panic, I called uh, Nathan Herzog. I mean, I got his number. I was a journalist, so I could find people. Hmm. I called Nathan. I said, uh, you don't know me. I'm Jeff Morgan. I'm writing a story on kosher wine for the Wine Spectator. And they said, oh, okay, great. Well, yeah. what, what can we do for you? And then yeah. he put me on the phone with a, another gentleman named Jay Booksbaum. He's the, he's the right and the left-hand man. 
and <laughs> um, said, and the educator. So Jay educated me real quick. That's not possible, but you know, he gave me what he could and he told me everything he wanted me to say. I've known Jay and Nathan, so I've known them. This was um, 30 years ago, mm. uh, two weeks before my daughter Zoe was born. I wrote this story. I interviewed some other people too, tasted a lot of wines. Most of them were not so good, but a few were very good. Mm. Went to a few kosher restaurants in New York and um, you know, came up with an article. I guess they liked it at the Wine Spectator and they kept me on the, on the, on the docket. Uh, yeah. As a freelancer for three years, and then eventually they offered me a full-time position as the West Coast editor in 1995. They moved my family and I to California, where I stayed until 2000, writing about everything, not just kosher wine. But every year wow. I would write the kosher story. Hmm. And uh, so I got to know a little bit more about kosher wine and Jews and Jews who make kosher wine over yeah. the years. And I got to know the Herzog family better, which was really a blessing because hmm. they're, they're um, not just a winemaking family there. They got serious neshama going over there. And mm. they're very, um, they're very warm, very generous family. Oh, they came. they're really good businessmen too. So they're not always so warm and generous, <laughs> but basically they're very warm, generous and honest people who I'm mm. very close to. And That's without true. whom I don't think I would have been able to make covenant. I hope you've been enjoying this episode so far featuring Jeff Morgan. If you like thinking about not only American wines, but Israeli wines as well. I want to give you a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Eric Siegelbaum discussing Israeli wines. For Israel, the differentiating factors is less soil. Again, it's mostly limestone and terrosa. Mm -hmm. It's more elevation, like up in the Golan and the Galil, you're much higher elevation. In the Judean hills, you're quite high elevation. In fact, when I show people photos of the Judean hills and I say, where do you think this is? I hear a lot, oh, that's like Sonoma. That's, that looks like Sonoma Coast. Uh -huh. I'm like, nope. <laughs> That's Israel. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek into next week's episode on Israeli wines, an introduction featuring Eric Siegelbaum, which I hope you come back for. Now back into this episode featuring Jeff Morgan. So fast forward, um, <clears throat> we, 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 I quit The Spectator in, in 2020. I was living in Napa. I moved to Napa. I, I left The Spectator in 2000, moved up to Napa Valley, st started working for Dean and DeLuca, the food emporium, mm. uh, which was nationwide at the time, actually international as their wine director. And I started a little winery or wine brand of my own called Solo Rosa. It was a rosé brand. I was like way ahead of my time. Wow. Nobody else was doing <laughs> only rosé. Solo Rosa, only rosé. That's all I did. Yeah. But um, it was, so then in 2002, um, we had a Jewish tasting group in Napa. None of us were particularly observant, uh, but yeah. we were all Jews. You know, Jews kind of congregate anyway. And, yeah. and so that's when we met um, uh, Eli Ben Zaken from Castel, the man du Castel, he was visiting uh, San Francisco. We invited him up to do a tasting and that's when we tasted the Castel, which is now kosher. But back in 2002, it wasn't. We were probably tasting the 2000 version, which was totally not kosher. Um, but what do we know? You know, yeah. Israel it must be kosher. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the beginning of that. Anyway, um, ultimately, um, I, I, so I, I needed Shomer Shabbat hands, right? I didn't have any Shomer Shabbat hands at home. I called Nathan Herzog, uh, cause, and huh. I said, uh, I said, Nathan, actually, I flew to New York to talk to him about this because it was a big project that I wanted to do. I needed, I, I wanted to ask him if I could make my wine, my covenant wine in yeah. the Herzog winery in uh, Southern mm. California. Uh -huh. And because we were friends, uh, it was it was a good conversation. He said, sure, as long as, you know, you, I can be your distributor in New York and New Jersey. <laughs> and I, I said, well, that's great because I'm going to need a distributor. So that was the yeah. deal. Now Royal Herzog and the Royal, Royal family kind of distribute us throughout much of um, most of America and much of the world, to be honest. Wow. But anyway, so back then I didn't have any wine at all. I would schlep my grapes down to Southern California in a big truck from Napa Valley, my Cabernet grapes. And I did that for five years. And so I made the first five vintages at uh, Herzog Wine Cellars. Oh, wow. And in Oxnard, it, right? Now it is. It was before Oxnard. We started in another, in Santa Maria, and eventually moved to Oxnard. We used my protocols, and I used their Shomer Shabbat hands. And the deal was I couldn't touch the wine and without, I couldn't touch the wine, period. And they couldn't touch it without me being there. <laughs> so it was a good relationship. But because I was there a lot, you know, I, I watched the guys in the cellar, the Meshkikim, who are also just winemakers. Mm -hmm. They did stuff like, I don't know, they did something called Mincha. Something ah. called yeah, I've huh. never seen this. I had no idea what was going on. Best of them would say to Hillam in front of my tanks, just to give it the extra, <laughs> you know, something. It was really, uh, <laughs> so wow. I didn't know Hillam more either. So I figured, God, I am really one clueless Jew. I got to learn something about this. And so that inspired me to actually start, I would say, my Jewish education. 
So it was mid 2000s, late 2000s? Yeah, 2003 to 2007, I was down at the Herzog Wine Cellars. Yeah. 2008, um, we moved our production back up to Napa Valley with uh, Jonathan Haydu, who uh, has yeah. been working with me. He was, at, he was at Royal, he was at Herzog also mm. uh, when I started a little later. But so we've been making wine together really since 2004. I think this is a good moment since you mentioned yeah. Jonathan that you worked on this brandy together. So I'm going to bust out this brandy. So yeah. it's, and not, there's not too many kosher brandies out there, right? No, because not you got to start with kosher wine. You have to start with kosher wine. Right. And then distill it. And then distill it. Right. And this um, is 92 and, proof. This is a 92 proof, right? That's 92. I'm actually drinking the new one, which is, um, nine, it's, it's just 90. Uh, okay. A little less alcohol. Yeah. Actually, it's, yeah. Uh, anyway, the time. I'll okay. drink that. I'll drink to that. So, um, yeah. So Jonathan and I have been making Covenant together almost since the very beginning. And we make oh, wow. the brandy. And he has his own brand, Heydu, that, um, you know, uh, he makes also at Covenant Winery, in case anybody was wondering. Um, I saw that he just so, came out with a vermouth, actually. Yeah, he's got the vermouth. And uh, yeah. I really stunk up the whole winery. But it's oh, really in the bottle. Well, it's very powerful uh, herbs and essence that you use to get the vermouth. So you can really oh, smell wow. it from a mile away. So it <laughs> smells good in the bottle. It's just, it smells good in the winery too, but you don't want to have all this smell in the winery. But, uh, yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan's a mad scientist and uh, <laughs> excellent winemaker also. I'm very, I'm proud to have him on the team and he is the official winemaker um, at Covenant also. Oh, okay. I'm the official, I'm the founding winemaker. Okay. Uh, and you know, after a while, you know, it's like, come on, let's let's be honest. Jonathan's the guy. He doesn't, hmm. you know, they're my protocols, and uh, we we do it a lot of it together. But he's the one. He's in charge of production. Wow. Um. Anyway, so yes, yeah, hmm. so um, so there you go. So you know, what about Jews and wine and Jews and kosher wine? So. During this time, I was learning, you know, I taught myself how to read Hebrew. I actually read the Torah in English, so I knew what was in that. You know, that book, the Torah is like a pretty racy, racy book. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know, you know. Yeah. And, um, and um, uh, you know, there was a Chabad rabbi in Napa when I was up there. He, he helped <laughs> me get started also. You know, he yeah. got me my tefillin, which... You know, I admit I don't put on enough, but I need, I know how to do it. And I got them. And, um, and, um, and uh, anyway, so it was all good. And I helped him. I, we made a, a wine together for a while called Kuve Chabad, uh, which um, <laughs> was a lot of fun. Around this time, my daughter, Zoe, um, who was brought up in a very similarly non, you know, secular environment as my wife, Jody and I were, I mean, she grew up in Napa Valley. She went to Napa, high, or not Napa, at Santa Elena High School. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were the only family that had two Jewish parents uh, of all 500 kids in the school. Zoe wanted to do her junior year abroad. Uh, she was going to Portland State University. She wanted, you know, she wanted to go to Barcelona, Spain, <laughs> but she was doing so badly in Spanish that they weren't going to let her go. So yeah. Jody said, well, why don't you go to Israel? You know, you don't have to speak Hebrew. You get into the program. <laughs> 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 So I said, okay, I'll do that. And so Zoe went to Haifa, 2013, I think. She did a year there and fell in love with Israel. Also met a guy there. Uh, came back, finished her senior year here, and then went, moved back to Israel. And she's, she lived there for eight years. And she got married. She's an Israeli wow. citizen. She's married to an Israeli guy. And she ran our, our Covenant Israel program for six years in Israel. How did you decide to set up Covenant Israel? Uh, in 2011, the, California wasn't enough. <laughs> Go to Cal Israel also. I thought it was. You know yeah. something? I I didn't really know much about Israel. Um, I think I passed through there on a, you know hitchhiking as a teenager. You know when I was 19, but really nothing. So in 2011, um, my partner Les Rudd and I, my business partner, we mm -hmm. thought, gee, maybe we should go to Israel and you know check it out. We're like, we, we'd become fairly well-known well kosher winemakers, but like we didn't know squat about Israel. We hadn't been there in 30 or 40 years. So wow. we get, you get off the plane and of course, you know, you get off the plane, you get in a taxi and the taxi driver says, welcome home. And that's it. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, uh, you're hooked. At least yeah. I was. 
and uh, I already had you know a lot of friends and family there that I hadn't seen in a long time. So yeah. we, um, you know, I I I, I, went, I went around. Actually, but I think this is a good segue to try one of the Israeli ones you sent me. Yeah, let's get the Adam. Well, I was thinking the Syrah. So I smell both of them. Oh, did I send you the Israeli Syrah or did I send you the Lansman Syrah? Lansman Syrah. You, yeah. Oh, is Lansman, is that California? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, whatever. I'll, I'll still take the segue. This one is bursting with the Roma versus the Lansman. The sea, the, 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 the see. You've got the blue sea, the blue sea. The yeah, sea, blue sea. It's, a, it's sea Cajol. The yeah. blue sea is a blend of Syrah and Cabernet. From the Galilee and from the Golan. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, a really fun, easy drinking wine. And yeah. um, just by the way, just from the aroma, it's like bursting with berries, just fruity, yeah. just an explosion yeah. on the nose. It's uh, actually one of the vineyards uh, we source the grapes from is biodynamic, which means it's beyond organic. We need another session to talk about biodynamic. I was gonna say it's good marketing. It sounds like good marketing speak. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's real. It's real. Oh, okay. I mean, it's not the only way to grow good grapes, but it just, I, it, that vineyard happens to be farmed biodynamically by the owners. I don't own it. I just okay. buy the grapes from them. But, right. um, yeah. Ooh, delicious. Yeah. Thank you. It's pretty smooth. So, like mouthfeel. It's not crazy. It's like pretty. Co- we try not but, to do crazy. We try to do smooth, lush, ripe, rich, and yummy. That's this is definitely, style. this is definitely a lot of the rich and yummy. It's a, it's a yeah. pretty big one. Yeah. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics, as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you, and now back into the show. After a couple of weeks knocking around in Israel with also with a buddy of mine um, who's an American who's lived there for 30 years, Ari Earl. He makes some um, wine with me now and he makes Bat Shlomo wines as well. Um, hmm. uh, Ari and I, uh, Ari's from California, so we knew each other from California already. And um, I, I just looked at Ari and I said, this is ridiculous. Why am I not making wine in Israel? I mean, that's like, you know, first of all, we're commanded to go plant a vineyard in Israel and make wine in Israel, right? <laughs> it's in there. It's in that book, that racy book. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I felt that I felt compelled to do this. And mm-hmm. it was the worst financial decision I've ever made in my life. But it was the best <laughs> spiritual decision I've ever made. It's a and, uh, I, 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 you know, it's been 10 years. And it's my ninth year that I made wine in Israel. And I've oh, wow. made a lot of good friends. I've gotten to know my Israeli family so much better. Mm-hmm. Um, Zoe became, you know, Zoe became Israeli. I became Israeli. My wife, yeah. Jody, we're all Israeli citizens now. Yeah. And, huh. um, you know, and, and I'm trying to plant that vineyard over there. I just haven't found the, the, the right investor yet. Uh, I'll mm-hmm. sell for any investor with the right money. I haven't found the right money <laughs> to plant yeah. and build the winery that I would like to do. To, to so you just source the grapes from different uh, mm-hmm. vineyards and then you make yeah. them there? Yeah. But um, I do the same thing in California. We don't grow our own. We don't have our own vineyards. Hmm. Um, I used my business partner had his own vineyards and we used his grapes un- until he passed away three years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a new business partner who's a great guy. His name is Jeff Rochwarger, by the way. And another Jeff, Jeff? Lives in you know, no. Jeff. No, I was just saying there's another uh, Jeff. There's another Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> but he's G-E-O-F-F. Now, Jeff is originally from New York, then Teaneck, New Jersey, but he lives in Bet Shemesh. He's been there for about 20 years. And um, he's a, uh, a wine aficionado as well and, and a great partner for us over there. That's great. But, Wait, can, um, I, can I ask why, what works out well for both California and Israel to source grapes elsewhere rather than having your own vineyard? Well, it works out well if you don't have enough money to plant a vineyard and buy the land. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, uh, that's basic economics. Uh, I okay. would love to buy, a, uh, I would love to buy, there's a parcel I, I wanted to buy here in Berkeley also just about 20 minutes from the winery up in the hills. There's a lot yeah. of land available, uh, but I, I just didn't have the capital. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do this. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, we're doing pretty well, but we don't have uh, we don't have the capital to invest in an- another winery, and another vineyard ourselves. So we're looking mm. for okay. partners. I'll just put that out there. You know, anybody who's watching this and would be interested in, in building a winery, planting a vineyard with us, either in Israel or in California should, you know, let me know. 
Wow, that's really neat. Yeah. But so, anyway, and so, uh, so it wasn't necessarily because of your daughter Zoe that you created Covenant Israel, or that was. Oh well, no, no, she. I was there first. Oh. She didn't oh. get to Israel until about 2012 or 13. Okay. I got there in 2011, and we our first vin, our first uh, vintage was 2013, a Syrah okay. that we made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is our first label. Wow, that is really cool. Yeah, we got we. Let's see. I don't know. I'm trying to get it out of there. It is. He got. Oh no, this way. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. Uh, anyway, we were um, got into a lot of trouble with this label. Yeah, cause because it includes um, stuff across the green line. What green line? Okay. <laughs> it's not on the. It's not on the label. That's why you got in trouble. <laughs> There's no green. So line. I mean, as I said to uh, uh, Omer Sharon, the son of Ariel Sharon, who I know. Yeah, well, I, I showed him this as I, you know, I, as I came out with this, this, this wine the first time in 2013, I was at the family farm, the Sharon farm down, oh. in, um, down in the southern part of the state. And uh, uh-huh. I said, oh, you see this? See, well, first of all, right, you know, Omri, we got, you know, see, we kept that, we got that in here. We kept that in, right? <laughs> but yeah. uh, no, it's over here. Uh, we, we kept, kept your dance, uh, we kept Samaria. This, we kept yeah. that in. But you see this thing? I, see that little thing there? <laughs> yeah, the Gaza Strip. What? Yeah, we gave you know your dad gave that away, so we kept it up. <laughs> and it, yeah. fortunately, he has a good sense of humor because yeah. he's a big guy, and uh, we had a good laugh. But anyway, um, we we couldn't sell this wine in Tel Aviv. I mean, it was like ridiculous. So, um, oh, but you could sell it in other parts of Israel, just not Tel Aviv. No, we could sell it in Brooklyn. Did very well in Brooklyn. Okay. And in parts of in Jerusalem, yes. Uh, anyway, okay. so we have other labels now. But okay, yeah. I'm a, you know I'm, obviously I'm a Zionist and I'm a little um, when it comes to Israel somewhat right wing. I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. So the wine brought us to Israel. The wine brought us to Judaism. Hmm. The wine obviously has so something special about wine, Rabbi. I don't know what it is. The wine brought me to my bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, which was, you know, Parsha Noah. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. I was not much of a believer um, 20 years ago, but uh, I've definitely become a, a, an active member of our tribe uh, yeah. since I started making kosher wine. And wine has been an important part of that story, part of that journey. It's yeah. been the, um, I think driver. it's been the, yeah, the driver. It's, yeah. the, it's the centerpiece of this, yeah. of this whole, I, I mean, I, if you told me, uh, 30 years ago that I would be a well-known kosher winemaker, yeah. you know, well-known. I mean, they know me in Taiwan. Uh, they know <laughs> me in Tokyo. You know? wow. They know me in Paris and in London. They know Covenant. And it's like, really? I, would have, I wouldn't have believed you. But, but I think more important, if you told me that I would be a member of a modern Orthodox synagogue, <laughs> someday I would not have believed that. And that I actually would go there, which I do. I never would have believed that. Uh, and that my son-in-law is Israeli. I got another one that might be my son-in-law soon. He also is Israeli with my other daughter. I mean, it's just, wow. <laughs> Somehow the wine or Hashem reached out through wine, because I am a wine geek, and said, okay, you're on the wrong path. Now I'm going to get on the right path. That's really great. So. The covenant. So I know in the 2000s, you were saying, I'm going to go really back to the 2000s. You were saying you were on your way, that sort of 2003 through 2007 part of your life. What happened after 2007? So Jonathan had um, left Herzog Wine Cellars um, uh-huh. and he had gone off to start his own Heydu brand and mm-hmm. he had another project uh, uh, that he wanted to pursue up in Napa. Mm-hmm. That project fell through. And I realized that if I didn't grab him, I was going to have to keep driving down to Herzog Wine Cellars. It's a six, seven, eight hour drive, depending on the yeah. traffic and a lot of driving. And, and I thought and I'd really much rather make the wines closer to Napa. That's where my fruit sourcing was. So I, I said I called him. I said, dude, um, you know, we work with me and uh, up here in Napa because he was going to move north anyway. He thought to, to Oakland, where there's, uh, Oakland and Berkeley are the closest, you know, observant communities to mm-hmm. the Napa Valley. Yeah. Can I go on a tangent? How much yeah. of those sort of in the sort of Jewish community in, in Oakland and Berkeley, how many of them in a general sense are involved with the kosher wine industry up there? Is there a small cadre of people to one degree or another involved? That's yeah, very small. I mean, there's, you know, Jonathan. Uh-huh. 
Um, Dashiell, um, you know, Dashiell yeah. Ferguson, who the brilliant Dashiell Ferguson, who yeah. regaled us on your show some a uh, few weeks ago yeah. with his you know, astute understanding of everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he, we, we're very fortunate to have uh, Dashiell working with us uh, now for about six months, and he's yeah. our seller master. Oh, great. Um, there's, um, you know, there are a few other guys, David Edelman, he works with us. He also, um, he's mm-hmm. kind of a roving mishkiach. Uh, he lives okay. in Oakland, but he, he works with us and he worked uh, freelance and he works with uh, a few other wineries, uh, that are making kosher wine up here. Um, yeah. and then there's Dan Levin. Uh, he also, um, is like David, they work together. There are a couple of guys who do some mishkiach work, but it, that's about it. It's not, oh, really? um, I, oh, it's I, not I, that I need big. to, I need I, I need to put out an, a plug or uh, uh, now that I've asked for an investor to help me build, that's, you know, my dream winery in, that's, in Israel. That's what, what podcast what guest I, appearances are for is for putting in plugs. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I really need from this podcast. Yeah. yeah. There's a dearth of young, inspired Shomer Shabbat people out there, hmm. men or women, uh, yeah. who seem who, who are inspired enough to actually make wine make kosher mm-hmm. wine. We have a position. In fact, we have two positions. Uh, we have a full-time position in yeah. our cellar. All you need is passion. We'll train you, but you got a passion. You got to stick around in Berkeley for a couple of years, at least, um, and work in the cellar and learn how to make really great wine. Uh, and then we have a, a harvest intern position, which is just for harvest, which is kind of August through uh, maybe October, early November. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we, um, we we've looked all over the world oh, really? and we can't see, we can't seem to find it. Uh, we put out, you know, advertisements and stuff we've had, we've been inundated with requests to work for us from non-religious people all oh. over the world, really oh. highly qualified. I mean, they're all like, they have PhDs. Okay. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And well, we can't, but they, they, they neglected to understand the Shomer Shabbat part. You know, we said here at the requirement, you know, Good attitude, be Shomer Shabbat. They don't know yeah. what that means. So, so um, we we are really we have a full time job for somebody um, mm. who wants to come on probably in June uh, indefinitely if it works out, mm. reasonably good pay, and they don't need. I mean, it'd be nice if they'd made wine or worked in a winery, but they don't have to. Mm. And then the same with the harvest intern. Um, that's also a paid position, um, pretty good pay, and mm. that's for three months at harvest time which is in the, in the fall, in case you don't know that, people. We're really looking, and we really, I mean, if you know anybody, if you know, if you're, you, if you're my age and you know some, you know, you, we're not going to hire you if you're my age because I, I already know that there's certain, you need to be able to lift um, you know, 35 pounds, you need to be able to be on your feet a lot, and um, mm-hmm. you, you need to be a little younger, but, you know, you, you don't have to be a kid. Um, so, I mean, Dashiell's, doing just fine. And he's, you know, early forties. So anybody who knows anybody send them my way, they can reach me at Jeff at covenant wines.com. That's Jeff J E F F at covenant wines.com. You get to work with Jonathan Haydu, one of the greatest kosher winemakers alive. And he's a cool me. dude too. And he's a very cool dude. Me yeah. and a whole, MIT. my, my daughter, Zoe, who's, you know, really fantastic. She works at the winery with us. My wife, Jody, she's the CEO. She's, keeps it all together. It's, it's, it's a family kind of small thing. And hmm. it's very nice. And obviously you get all your, you know, all the hugging off and, uh, you know, you get half a Friday off and actually we don't work that hard except when we have to. So um, it's, harvest it's, season, it's, probably it's, <laughs> it's probably pretty well, intense. Harvest season. Harvest. Yeah. Harvest is hard, but um, yeah. you know, if you want to be a banker or a lawyer or a doctor, okay, I get that. That's good. Or if you want to go to yeshiva and study for the rest of your life, fine, you can do that. But if you're, you know, kind of like you want to stay connected, but maybe you have another idea. You want to stay connected to Judaism. I don't think there's anything better than making great kosher wine and raising the bar for Yiddishkeit through wine. That's what Covenant has done and a number of other great wineries, uh, both in America and in Israel. And together we're, we're changing the paradigm so that when now when people write about kosher wine, they don't have to worry about being accused of being anti-Semitic. Hmm. because there's a lot of good wine out there, kosher wine. 
Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I want to break in again, and if you have ideas beyond the show, beyond the podcast, beyond this video content, if you have ideas for what Jewish drinking can bring you, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's Zoom sessions, maybe it's uh, events, maybe, who knows, swag, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear from you any ideas, things that we can do, uh, things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. I'm going to go in two different directions. One, I wanted to sort of pick up on that about the how much has the kosher wine scene changed in the 19 years since you started Covenant? 20 Great. years ago, there was, yeah. there was almost nothing good. I mean, the Herzogs were making some very good wines. I gave them some very high scores when I was at Wine Spectator. So I knew it was possible. That's why I knew it was possible to make a really good wine. But uh, yeah. across the board, there was not a lot of good stuff. Israel was the same. There was a couple of good you know, wineries. Better ones at the time weren't even kosher, I didn't think. And then uh, you know, in the last 20 years, there's been this uh, explosion of interest and quality and, and excitement. Uh, and it's based on the fact that you know the wines in, in that we're drinking today, kosher wines, are you know, are, are, can be, and sometimes are on a par with the greatest non-kosher wines. I mean, that's the whole goal. There should, there's nothing that we do kosher that is different than what they do at the most famous wineries in the world. We don't even add yeast to our wines at Coven. We don't add yeast. We don't filter a lot of them. We don't, uh, it's a very natural. It's, it's just the way the, the, the mockers who make non-kosher wine make wine. We do the same thing. You got to have good grapes. You got to know what to do with them. So I have two questions. How, to what would you attribute that growth and the improvement of the quality in the last two decades, but also how much would you say, how much of a factor have you and your covenant wines been as part of that growth, that improvement overall? Well, I would like to believe, I'll ask the yeah, second part of the question first, then we'll go back to the second part, second, okay. uh, first part, second. So I would like to think that covenant was um, one of the standard bearers for a new paradigm. I, I okay. actually, I know it was wasn't alone. Uh, Domaine de Castel inspired us, okay, in Israel. And there are a number of other, the Herzogs, of course, uh, were making some very, very good wines. And they, I would say that, you know, they are hugely influential when it comes to the, the change in kosher wine in the last 20 or 30 years. They make it, they import it, they sell it, they promote it. I mean, these guys, you know, they've really raised the bar and raised consciousness. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons that we've seen this change in quality is that a lot of people who make kosher wine today, they've been trained in uh, enology programs around the world, really good ones like at Davis or in Bordeaux or whatever, or they've worked with really fine winemakers. I would say there is, it's, there is, a, um, there is a dearth, meaning there, there are not enough Select, yeah. Shomer Shabbat kosher winemakers. Um, hmm. Those this is a this is the next challenge to get you know observant Jews to get their nose out of whatever they're studying and get yeah. their nose in the wine glass. Now mm -hmm. I don't want to put down studying; it's important, okay. And I don't want to put down you know being a successful businessman. That's important too. But really, I know that there's a lot of you out there that are wondering what's what do I really want to do? How do I really want to devote myself to Yiddishkeit and a Jewish mm -hmm. life? And I think that you know agriculture and Jewish cooking, these are, these are part of our lifeblood. This is what sustains us in life. And this is something that I, I hope we will see more of in the future. I mean, <laughs> so, I'm on board with that pitch. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us here on the Jewish Drinking Show. It's really been great. It's been really wonderful, especially drinking your wines and the really cool branding you did with John, Jonathan Adrew. So thank you. And uh, time. 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 <laughs>